Good morning. morning. Grace and peace to you and happy Mother's Day to you, all of the mommies out there. And happy Mother's Day to everyone who had a mother. And thank you very much. I appreciate that. I do want to share with you a few announcements. First of all, we do have coming up tomorrow night our Ad Board and Trustees meeting at 7 o'clock. So if you'd like to come out, we would like to see you. And many hands make light the work. Just a reminder, Tuesday is the primary election day. And we all know that primary elections are primary because they're very important. So we need to make sure that we go out and we vote and we make educated votes. And also we have the sandwich sale pickup tomorrow at St. James from one to six. So if you did order sandwiches, I'm sure you have uh, your plan worked out for that. On the 17th, we have our special session of annual conference at Williamsport. And then the 18th to the 20th, we have our annual conference. Um, I would ask that you please pray for all of those who will be there. It will be, um, it will be a very different kind of annual conference. I, will, I was asked to pray during our special session, so I will be praying after the disaffiliations of the churches in the State College District. So uh, pray for me <laughs> that I get through that. Um, also, we have coming up on Thursday morning, Ladies Coffee and Conversation at St. James at 930. Next Sunday is baccalaureate, so if you do have a graduating senior that you love and adore and would like to go, they would love to have you. So that's 7.30 next week. And uh, the next soup kitchen is coming up on May 31st at St. James, and Paula Smith will give you all the details on that. Are there any other announcements that you would like to share this morning? And seeing none, would you please rise in body or spirit as we prepare our hearts for worship by singing together the sanctuary song. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. draw your attention to our centering words today. God calls and welcomes all of humanity. We who claim love for Christ are called to extend welcome through word and action to all everywhere. Please join me now in our call to worship. How shall we love the Lord our God who has poured out such love upon us? How shall we demonstrate that love? Let our love be genuine and holy. Continuing now with the opening prayer. Lord of wondrous light and power, we come to you this day to learn of your will for our lives. Heal our wounds, lift our spirits, give us courage and confidence to boldly serve you in all that we do. Amen. Please turn in your hymnal to number 534 as we sing together, Be Still My Soul. Your 
rather many blessings from God as those created in God's image. We are entrusted to share those blessings so that others may come to know the extravagant kind of love of God and feel his mighty presence with them. So if you would please join with me as we prepare to bless the offerings by first singing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Holy God and author of our existence, our story is part of a much greater story. Your hand is visible on every page and every scene. So too, our stories cannot be discon disconnected from those in the past who have shaped the steps we take, saints and sinners, rebels and followers. They are part of our story as we are part of theirs. And as we offer gifts this day, we pray they might be used to strengthen the story of faith that will be told by those who will come after we are gone. We pray this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Our children's story focuses on Mother's Day and it's focusing on Proverbs 31 verses 25 to 31. Scripture's full of different thoughts about what God feels toward mothers, uh, but I wanted to share this specifically. We all have women in our lives who are mothers and mother figures as well, and we're grateful for all of those. And uh, God does say that a woman who loves him is clothed with strength and dignity, and that means that she's set apart from the rest. It doesn't mean that she's necessarily fancy. It means that she's set apart from the rest. But Proverbs 31 talks about mothers who love God like this. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Our mothers are wise and kind, and they are to be treasured by the Lord. And there are many stories that we could probably share about the different ways that the mothers and mother figures in our lives shaped us. One of the things that I struggled with most as a child was confidence and standing up for myself because I was as shy and backward as you're going to find a child. So quiet, my parents would forget I was in the room and would actually look down the hall and call my name when I was sitting right beside them. That's a quiet kid. And when I was very small, I was uh, riding on a little riding toy. It was so small, I didn't even have pedals. I was just pushing myself along on the sidewalk in front of my grandmother's apartment. And my grandmother was watching me. And as I scooted down the sidewalk, this not very nice lady, Estelle, stood there with her finger pointing at me and her hand on her hip saying, don't you come any further down this sidewalk because this sidewalk is mine. Well, 
I turned around and looked at my gram because my gram knew everything. And my gram said, that sidewalk belongs to everyone. You go keep right on going. And I turned and I, I knew that if my gram said it was okay, it was really okay. And I'm gonna listen to my gram and not her. And I kept on going. It's advice like that in those times when we really were unsure how to go that we know, number one, they love us because they're not gonna give us bad advice. And number two, they want us to succeed. So even though they know our flaws because our mothers and mother figures definitely know our flaws, they're willing to work with us to work them through. And what a glorious blessing that is. God loves all mothers and wants us to love our mothers too. And he says her children stand to bless her. What are some ways you can bless your mom? Even those moms in heaven today with the wisdom you can pass along. We have so much to be thankful for when it comes to those mothers who love us like godly mothers. God used them to bring us into the world. He uses them every day to lead us and love us just like him. So as we celebrate Mother's Day and we think about all of those mother figures that we have in our lives, if they're with us, tell them thank you. If they're not, pray and give thanks for them. But tell God we love him today by showing that love for them. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for mothers and all mother figures in our lives. Thank you for their love, patience, kindness, wisdom, and their hearts for you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, and all God's children said, amen. <coughs> Excuse me, I have got... Yes, we are, we are, Arlene is a blessing for providing all of these lovely flowers. Thank you for that. There are many reasons for us to pray. There is a lot that goes on in the world. Ministry continues no matter what else is happening in the world. And we have to not only be making disciples, but we do have to make peace and we have to make a way and we have to help others. So we're going to first pray and, and share with God what's on our heart this morning. <clears throat> then we will all pray together. Lord of love, you've asked us to keep your commandments as a sign of our love for you. In your life, you demonstrated the power of love to affect healing and redemption and hope in the lives of all your people, those who know you and those who do not yet. Yet we're so unsure of the gifts that you've given us for ministry that we wonder if we can really do what you want us to do. We're a strange mixture, Lord. We are arrogant in our demands of your mercy and timid in our awareness of the blessings and gifts you've given to us. That's why we're here today. We really want to sense your presence and receive courage truly to be your people in this world that you've loaned to us. Remind us when we bring names and circumstances before your throne of grace that we also bring our own needs and concerns. Lay your healing hand upon our hearts and our spirits and make us brave and give us courage to do what it is you called us to do. All good begins with prayer. So let us now share the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture passage comes from the book of John. It is John 14, verses 15 to 21. 
reading from the New American Standard Bible, copyright 1995. It's a word for word translation of the original language. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be, my, be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. The second passage comes from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 to 31. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, and even some of our, your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. And finally, 1 Peter 3, verses 13 to 22. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you <clears throat> to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient. When the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. So the question we ask today is, can we be like Jesus? There are some movements now that are trying to teach people they can be God. Okay, that's not a joke. There is a literal push to claim that you create yourself. It's interesting. <laughs> You're already here. God created you. And we choose the life that we're going to live by the decisions that we make. But we can be like Jesus. That is in the Bible. That is what Jesus tells us. We can be more like Jesus if we choose to be. So can we be like Jesus, though? Because that's a nice theory. But can we, each one of us, be like Jesus? In the first reading, Jesus teaches uh, his followers that if they love him, they will keep his commandments, which give clear instruction about how to treat your relationship with God and how to treat other people, especially the people who aren't like you, especially the people who don't think like you, especially the people who resist the word of God. And it also teaches us very clearly that we're not just to hold on to all of this teaching, we are to go and make disciples. So we can hearken back to that last message series about the stages of spirituality, and we can see our personal communal and visionary uh, spirituality are very deeply rooted in commandments that teach us how to treat our relationship with God and treat our relationship with each other. The earliest examples of discipleship speak through those next two scriptures. You've got Paul, the visionary, because he has mastered his personal and communal faith and spirituality. He's gone to Greece. He's gone to Athens, where you literally cannot swing your arms without hitting some statue that they worship for this, that, and the other thing. Curly hair and a good harvest, you name it, they've got one for everything. And he proclaims to the Athenians the truth of the gospel of Christ. And when Peter then advises Christians to be prepared to testify to their hope in Christ, which we heard Paul do, Jesus speaks to our personal spirituality. Peter gives clarity about that communal spirituality together as the body of Christ, where we're preparing to do just that, be able to give that answer when someone asks us, why do you go to church? Why do you read the Bible? Why do you follow Jesus? And Paul, of course, takes his visionary spirituality to Greeks, to the area, Areop area Areopagus. That place that I was saying perfectly fine yesterday and today, for whatever reason, I cannot say it. And he was there to be of service to them, providing truth about their unknown God, which was interesting. They had a God for everything. They ran out of things, apparently, but not idols. And so they needed to use that idol, I guess. But what a wonderful opportunity that became for Paul. In that last reading from Peter, that's what I'm going to linger on this morning because it involves something each of us has to attend to, and that's being prepared to testify to our hope in Christ. Sometimes I use Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of scripture called the message because it gives us that, in other words, way of hearing a particular passage and can give us a little bit more to chew on. And I'm going to read to you that same passage from 1 Peter 3 from the message so that we can linger there just a little longer. So this is 1 Peter 3, 13 and 22 from the message. If with heart and soul, you're doing good, do you think you can be stopped? Even if you suffer for it, you're still better off. Don't give the opposition a second thought through thick and thin, keep your hearts at attention. In adoration for before Christ your master, be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks you why you're living the way you are, and always with the utmost courtesy. Keep a clear conscience before God, so that when people throw mud at you, none of it will stick. They'll end up realizing they're the ones that need the bath. It's better to suffer for doing good if that's what God wants, than to be punished for doing bad. That's what Christ did definitively, suffered because of other sins. The righteous one for the unrighteous ones, he went through it all, was put to death and then made alive to bring us to God. He went and proclaimed God's salvation to earlier generations who ended up in the prison of judgment because 
they wouldn't listen. You know, even, the, even though God waited patiently all the days that Noah built his ship, only a few were saved then. Eight, to be exact, saved from the water, by the water. The waters of baptism do that for you, not by washing away dirt from your body, but presenting you through Jesus' resurrection before God with a clear conscience. Jesus has the last word on everything and everyone from angels to armies. He's standing right alongside God. And what he says goes. What he says goes. Are there times when you do what you know that you know that you know that you know is right and catch flack for it? You wish Jesus was standing right next to you, nodding his head in agreement with you because what he says goes. To be honest, you can read the passage from Peter's letter and think, easy for you to say, don't be afraid of those who want to harm you or don't get upset and, you know, just don't get upset, right? If you have a problem with getting upset, just don't get upset. Oh, sure. Okay. And I can imagine some people who heard Peter say things like that, but knew Peter back in the first four Gospels of the New Testament would have really understood what he was saying because they knew perfectly well he got upset all the time. Peter got upset at the drop of a hat. Moments after being told he is the rock on whom Jesus is going to build his church, moments later, he's calling him Satan. Get behind me, right? Just don't get upset. Simple. <laughs> Intellectually, it does make sense because we know haste makes waste. And when we do react, it can be bad. It can be wrong. And we can re really regret it. So we understand that it makes sense the right thing is and the, the right thing done the right way, because sometimes we will say something that we think someone needs to hear and we don't do it well at all. Did you ever do that? We just did not present it well at all. And it's because, like I've said before, it's not just what we say, it is how we say it that, that makes them want to hear it or not hear it. If they don't want to hear what you have to say, you could give them the answer to the secret of life and they're not going to take it if we love them enough to give them truth we have to love them enough to give it to them in a way that they will actually receive it it's part of the reason why jesus gives us the example of being calm and peaceful and not re reactive but responsive in a very loving way because even when someone else is not being very loving toward us, we can be loving toward them and we can actually bring about a little bit more of diffusing of a situation than feeding into it. And the reason why we need to make sure we do the right thing the right way is because there's never a right reason to do a wrong thing because wrong is always wrong. You aren't gonna, you aren't gonna write wrong just because you feel like it. And because wrong has consequences, you can't avoid. And sometimes those consequences involve the people that are directly connected to you. And good and right have consequences no one else can deny as well. We get this in our head, but when life happens and our buttons are pushed and we get angry, and even if it's after fear, sometimes when we get fearful, we become angry. We're fearful in the beginning, and then we become angry because we're afraid. We get upset, and we act out of being upset instead of act out of being loved and taught by Jesus how to respond well. So if we say that Jesus is our ultimate teacher and example, we want to be like him. The answer has to be, he is our ultimate teacher and example, and I need to be like him. Less like me, more like him. Now, here's how I see our dilemma when we are hit with the real life situation that comes out of nowhere. The world will tell you, you can't possibly deal with that situation like Jesus. You're not Jesus. No, you're not. 
No, am I? I'm not either. It's easier to just be like the world and let the fur fly. Do what the world does. The world cancels people. The world cuts and runs. The world runs other people down. And then let the dust fall where it may and let loose with it because, you know, even though you may not be able to change it, at least you'll feel better. Now, I've talked to a lot of people who thought that way and they did let it fly and they didn't feel better. And not only they, but the people around them didn't feel better either. So it's true that Jesus made it a point over and over and over that it's not, it's best not to be afraid and not to get upset. And that if he can do it, so can we. He was 100% human and 100% divine. The th things that humans have to learn to do are hard. If they were easy, we wouldn't have to learn to do them. But here's another part to this. To be more and more like Jesus brings us closer to Jesus. We say all the time, Lord, I want to be like Jesus. More like Jesus, I want to be. Oh, if I could just be more like Jesus, then I could get the same results Jesus gets. I don't think any of us want the same life Jesus lived with the same scorn and mockery and violence and misunderstanding, a lot of it willful misunderstanding. But if we were honest followers of Christ who speak the truth of God's holy word, face every day scorn and mockery, violence, and willful misunderstanding, just as much now as then. We aren't following Jesus' way because it is easy. We follow because it's the most sincere reflection of the very nature of God. And God's love for us demands it. We want to make that love real for other people. Remember, the church is the only organization that exists for its non-members. We want to make that love real for other people, make it true in their own lives, and just keep that movement going. Jesus is the model that we follow, and all that is the what of what we do. We don't struggle with the what, we struggle with the how. I remember when I graduated high school and I had no idea what I was going to do next. And college wasn't an option because, not because of grades, but it was just never really presented to me as a viable option for me. And so when I graduated high school, I started to work. And then I started to think, okay, well, what do I want to do in my work? What do I want to pursue? And so I got a part-time job at a radio station and uh, small-time broadcasting, but boy, I loved it. I didn't even mind doing a 12-hour shift on Christmas Day. It was awesome. And this station in a larger market contacted me not long after I'd started and offered me a job as a, their news person. And I was really excited that someone offered me that job. But the realities of my life were that I really can't take that job just yet. I didn't have a car. I lived at home. Even with the money they'd be paying me, it would be very difficult to swing an apartment and your utilities and a car and insurance. And so I, I discussed it with my parents and I said, well, I really don't think that I can take this because I don't think I'm situated to do that now. But I announced, uh, but I do want to go as far as I can go in broadcasting. 18 years old, out of high school, not going to college. And I announced to my family, I'm going to go as far as I can go in broadcasting. <laughs> I might as well have said I'd like to grow six feet tall. Anyone that I told that to pretty much looked at me like I had lost every bit of my mind I ever had. That's because I was judged as ill-equipped. I'd set a goal that was to them absolutely unattainable. People go to college for that. You can't do that. Well, college was impossible for me, but I still got the job. 
apparently I had other skills that were very well suited to the job that I didn't learn in college. Not saying you shouldn't go to college. <laughs> Trained a lot of kids. I actually worked with a lot of interns while I was working in radio. But think about it. Have you ever set a goal that was a dream goal, a God-sized goal, and shared it with other people that you really hoped would get behind you and encourage and support you? And they laughed, they joked, they disbelieved, made fun of. They basically perceived that you've set an unreachable living standard. Well, that's what a lot of people thought about anyone following Christ. Anyone trying to be like Jesus had set for themselves an unreachable living standard, one that only Jesus could ever meet. Not according to Jesus. Because he's the one who said we can do the same things that he did in even greater number. Now, we all know I didn't become Casey Kasem, <laughs> but I did have a great time, and I went as far as I actually wanted to go. Small-time local celebrity was enough for me. The blush fell off that rose after a while. But when it comes to following and serving God, God always, God does not always, rather, call the equipped. Now, you can read all the different stories in the Bible that tell you just that. God did not always call the equipped, but God always equips the called. And there were a lot of people God used in mighty ways who really did not believe they could do it. And yet they did. And there are so many tangible ways that God equipped me for the work of the church in of all places through the broadcasting experience. So let's look at this last part of that scripture again from Peter, where he talks about baptism. When we have completed stage one of our spirituality, our hearts have been strangely warmed like Wesley's. We really understand, my gosh, my God loves me. My God loves me. And that I matter to God. The universe is huge and the creator of it has a plan for me. And he put me here, right here, right now to be a part of that plan. My time is, is here and I'm up to bat. And I need to, with God's help, figure out what that plan is, which means I need to connect with a community. So I have now gone to stage two, my communal spirituality. And part of that is getting to the point where I can say, I am going to make the decision and I'm gonna express publicly, outwardly, my inward intention through baptism. Before we were even born, God loved us. We didn't do anything to deserve it. We didn't do anything even to respond or recognize it when we were babies. That love was just there. It simply existed. It was in our DNA. Now, we may not have always felt it, we may not have even wanted it at times, but it was there regardless of our response to it. And God's love never changes. Ours does. God's does not. At our baptism, we don't return the love that God has been giving us over all of those years. We're just simply perceiving God's love is broader than our limited self. Why else would Jesus die for me? When you meet an on fire for Christ Christian who's just made all of these realizations, it really is that light bulb moment face that you see where they're just on fire and they cannot wait to tell you all about it. And it's because they stopped allowing self-pity and doubt and the byproducts of suffering endured without connection to that greater purpose to lead every aspect of their life. Suddenly they realized they could be so much more than they, their former self, so much more than people told them they could be. Knowing God loves his children like a loving father should be a rejuvenating experience, pointing us to a higher and larger purpose beyond ourselves and our comfort and our needs and our wants and our desires connected to a power far greater than the ones that actually oppress us. We will have pushback. Jesus taught us how to deal with that too. And it's also how we're able to grow into the ability to live more and more like Jesus did. Did Jesus suffer? Did Jesus have pushback? 
we can learn from Jesus to turn the other cheek, to love our enemies, to love those who wish to harm us, to lift up in prayer those who seek to tear us down. It's actually to our benefit to do so. When we act out of our closeness to Christ, we're actually defending our confidence in God. We know our actions will not return void because Jesus tells us so. And the more we reveal our confidence in God through our behavior choices and our thoughtful responses, the more closely we grow to living like Jesus, whose entire life was a picture of living confidently in God. And really, that was the thing. People said, I don't understand how Jesus can sit with those people and talk to them. And I don't understand how Jesus can do this or do that or why this, why that, because he, was, he had all the confidence in the world in God. My story and your story can become one of trust and confidence in God, regardless of situations, circumstances, inconveniences. And it's revealed clearly by our actions toward others. And really that confidence in God is the true way to grow closer to living as Jesus did. I'd like you to go to the back of your order of worship and join with me in the response to the word. As we have sensed God's presence this day, we prepare to bring God's presence to the world. As God, our companion, walks with us, we prepare to walk as companions with others. May God prepare our hearts and minds to live these promises in the time before us. Amen. Would you please rise and body your spirit as you are able and turn to number 467 to sing together, trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. Christ, go now into this world with a healing love of God to be given generously in peace and hope. God's peace will always be with those who live in God's love. Let us pray.
Lord Jesus. In your glorious resurrection, you returned to us and commanded us, go tell. You not only returned to us, but you also commissioned us to be witnesses to your resurrection. Having been met by you in our daily lives, in the worship of our church, now we're chosen by you to go spread the news. We don't know why you chose people like us. But we do know that we are to show and to tell the world the news about you and your reign. Forgive us when we keep the good news to ourselves. Prod us to risk moving out and speaking up in your name. Show us the ever-expanding reach of your love as you reach out to others. Push us to cross borders, to go over boundaries, to open those closed doors. Give us what we need to be your missionaries, participating in the adventure of your embrace of the whole world, your world, and we will give you the glory. Amen. Thank you.